Hey, it's Warren Sprouse. We're, this is the Bible Forum. We're here every Sunday night from 8 until 10 p.m. Eastern. Love for you to join us live. We've got folks in the chat room. We, we, we chit-chat, and they torment me, and I try to ignore them. Uh, I want to talk to you tonight about the need of the hour. That phrase is oriented toward the poetic. This hour in the times in which we live, expressed in terms of its limitation, only this hour, only one life, and it will soon be passed. And only that which is motivated, empowered, and expressed by and through the Spirit of God from the Word of God will last. These are old sayings, but old sayings are old sayings and they're still around because they're true. But this is not the sentiment of the 21st century human being, let alone 21st century believers, people who claim to be Christians. We're all busy with all sorts of technological motivational goals. And for us, it's the program, the production, the payout that matters. But when Jesus, who is our example, embarked on significant or critical aspects of his earthly ministry, he tended to spend entire nights in prayer, talking with his heavenly Father. Now, the idea of prayer is communication. I I think it's doubtful that Jesus had any questions about the future or about his role. He was God. His prayer was no doubt more that of fellowship and concern for his disciples and how they're going to respond, as well as for the people who would follow like you and like me. All of which speaks strongly to this issue of prayer. Is prayer all about making sure God knows what I need? The Bible says God knows my need before I do. Is it all about making sure God knows what we want out of life? A job, a family, a house, wealth, health. Read your Bible and see if any of these pop up in terms of true priorities. Now, all of these are important. But Jesus said, Your Father in heaven knows what you have need of before you do. Matthew chapter 6, verse 8. Later on, we are told by Jesus to pray. He told his disciples, Pray that you would not enter into temptation. I think if I just live right, I won't be tempted. God says, you need to pray about that. There are temptations coming at you you don't even understand. And it isn't that you're going to be tempted to do go rob a bank. You might just be tempted to tell not the whole story. In, t in 1 Timothy chapter 6, the rich are warned about falling into temptation. But all of us fall into temptation. The rich have a greater temptation. Now, in life, most of us walk right into temptation, believing either that we won't be tempted or that God will protect us. Between churches one time, years and years, I was probably in my mid-40s, maybe, early 40s. And I drove a limo, drove a, a van, I drove a charter bus, I, I drove for a company. And I can remember doing what we call wait and returns, and especially in New York City. And dropping people off, having to wait several hours before you pick them up again. And having to go to the bathroom. And I can remember on a couple of occasions getting out and going into what 
I thought was something else, uh, <laughs> and asking to use the bathroom, only to find out that this was a place where they had naked women. Turn around, walk out. Don't have to go that badly. I learned to find places I could use a telephone that were outside of the place where people were. I didn't know what was going to happen next. And I remember walking into these environments, with, and it was always naked women, but you know, in, in alcohol-laden places or gambling places, whatever it might be. And I remember to this day when I walked in, I would get a headache. I didn't have a headache. That was emotional pressure. I knew I did not belong here. Well, I'm a big boy. I'm not going to be tempted. You are tempted in the area of your experience. I'm telling you this story that is almost 40, 30 years old. And I can see those images like they are in this room with me right now. And you can too. We walk right into temptation sometimes. We don't think it's really going to be a temptation. It's not going to bother us. God says it will. He says we are foolish. If you are a human, you will be tempted by the same things that every other human being has been tempted by. And if you walk into temptation with your eyes wide open, it's doubtful that God will keep you from it. You did walk in. You say, well, where was God when I walked in? Right where he was before you walked in. You knew better. Why is it that we are told in Scripture, we are commanded in Scripture to pray? Prayer is entreaty to God. Throughout the Old Testament, we read how men and women prayed to God, but mostly they prayed to men for help, for understanding, for mercy. <laughs> when they prayed to God, they did the same sort of thing. But the idea of prayer is the beseeching, the begging, the inquiry, the need in the New Testament, we get the same idea with the word prayer. There's a little more emphasis, however, on the prayer to God in the common sense that prayer is begging and requesting and so forth. Who else do we have when life is out of control? Who else do we have when the future is looming without a roadmap? Who else or what else do we have when a significant decision needs to be made? And how do we know when or if God answers our prayers? My experience has been that we pray and God works. We have no assurance that God is going to answer our prayer the way we think or the way we want or the way we think he should, <laughs> unless that prayer is rooted in God's word. Now, God has promised to do certain things. Praying that he would, would is usually a prayer that he could, because we know, but that he would now. And we have no assurance that God will do anything we want or need now, although he may. Prayer becomes a joy when we know our God is listening. And we are certain that he listens to his own word. We are also certain that he listens to his children. He listened to his son. But we have no guarantee that he will listen to people that don't belong to him. Or that he will listen in the sense of 
response to anyone. We want God in heaven, the Father, to do things for us, with us, around us, for our loved one. We have a whole list of these things. But the Bible makes it very clear that we have to go through the Son to get to the Father. Jesus said in Luke chapter 10 that even the devils are subject to Jesus through his Father's name. In Romans chapter 1, Paul thanks God through Jesus Christ for you all. In Romans 16, Paul's prayer to, is to God only wise, that he might be glorified through Jesus Christ forever. In 1 Corinthians 15, he talks about the victory that we have through our Lord Jesus Christ. If we're out there on our own and we are not indwelt by the Spirit of God and we're not born again of the Spirit of God, if we don't love God and we don't have Christ, our prayers are being uttered aloud to the people who are standing around or we're just encouraging ourselves, but they're not getting anywhere else. The blessings we have, including access to the Godhead in prayer, is all through the Lord Jesus Christ, who took our sin to the cross and paid that awful price. And the hymn tells us, tell it to Jesus. Tell what? Whatever there is, you either cannot do, cannot understand, cannot see. Whatever there is you need, you want, you care about, if it concerns you, tell him about it. Begging for his help as you would your earthly father. Communicating with him about the core issues of your life. Joining with him in whatever the result may be. Giving him your requests, your desires, your fears, that he might bear them with you. Knowing he has the power to take them away, if that would be the best for you. And the best, the best for you, the best for your family, the best for your testimony, the best for whatever it is God is doing in your life. Many of us and, and other people, too, pray for wealth. I don't want a million dollars, but I'd really like to have enough to pay my bills. But the Bible teaches us that God is committed to meeting that need in your life, if it's a need. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said, Your Father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask. Well, God let me down. You know, I had to sell my house. I couldn't afford to keep it. God let me down. God didn't let you down. You were in over your head. Were you living in the street? Well, no. I, I had to rent something, you know, cheap. I, I, I've only got, uh, you know, that's all you can afford. That's not God's fault. He is able the Bible says, to do exceedingly above, abundantly above all that we ask or think, and to do so according to the power that worketh in us, which is the power of God's Spirit who indwells every true believer. John tells us, or Jesus told us in John 14, if ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. You can't just tack Jesus' name on the end of your selfish prayer. No, no. If you ask in this circumstance what Jesus would ask for, the Father will do it. So, well, I don't know what that is. Then you need to study your Bible more and find out who Jesus is and what was important and what is important. It's difficult to comprehend until we realize that God is committed to our earthly physical needs even before we know what they are. 
When we ask in Jesus' name, we're asking in harmony with all that Jesus is and with all that Jesus desires for us. And we ask in harmony with all that we are as his children. Which is, we're dead. <laughs> we are dead to this world. We are dead in Christ. Dead to the things of this world. They don't mean anything. Galatians 2.20, my life's verse. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. And the life that I live now, I live in Christ. And if I'm not living that in Christ, then I'm not living. I'm only existing. And I can do this because as a Christian, I have been crucified with Christ. Crucified to, as far as sin is concerned and selfishness and all of that, I put all that aside. Not that it works perfectly, but that's my commitment. The difference now is that I didn't immediately die when I got saved. I have a life. I am still here, but now I have new life. And therefore, the life that I now have isn't mine. It's a life lived by the faith of the Son of God. And the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10, if any man draw back, you gave your heart to the Lord, and now you're saying, I don't, I don't know. He says, my soul shall have no pleasure in that man. You draw back from faith, God will have no pleasure in you. Because the first part of that verse, Hebrews 10, 38, says, now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draws back from faith, doesn't belong to me. Do you trust God? Say, sure I do. I trusted him for my salvation. Can you trust him for everyday life? Can you trust him for your everyday need? Do you have to know ahead of time that you're going to have it? Or can you just believe God that he's not going to let that mortgage payment or that rent payment come and not have the money to pay it? Assuming you didn't throw it away on six other things you knew you shouldn't have been spending it on. The truth is that God meets our needs faithfully every day. It's not his fault that I go out and run up debts for things I don't need but like to have. It isn't God's fault that I want things which are far beyond anything I actually need. You see, I need food. I need clothing. I need shelter from the elements. And after that, everything's about wanting. Today we might add, I need a car. <laughs> I need transportation. I need to get to work. But there may be somebody who would pick you up. Well, yeah, there may be a bus that runs. Yeah, but you know how long it takes to wait for the bus to get. Excuse me. There's Uber. And God is committed to meeting all of my, my needs. Matthew 6, 32. The idea is expressed in, the, in two places in Matthew 6. The first precedes what we call the Lord's Prayer. In chapter 6, verse 9 through 13. After which Jesus tells us not to lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven. Why? Because... Where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Think about all the things you tend to worry about. That's where your heart is. Not on God. God has given us all that we have. Or he has allowed us to get it. God could just as easily take it away. Why worry when you can pray? 
Prayer for our heart, our priorities, our understanding. Praying without ceasing. If we are stressed, if we worry, if we have fears, it may be we're not praying enough or properly. Those things are real, but they shouldn't cause us unnecessary stress. Our Father's got it all under control. He knows how it's going to work, and it's going to work just fine. Pray.